Yukio Mishima is a name synonymous with modern Japanese literature. Known for his numerous novels, plays, short stories, and essays, he is one of the most widely recognized authors to emerge from Japan in the 20th century. In spite of this acclaim and notoriety for his works in literature, his acting roles, his political beliefs, and the way in which he died, Yukio Mishima remains an enigma nearly 50 years following his death. Mishima was a renaissance man who involved himself in many artistic media. His legacy has stretched far beyond his death in 1970, numerous filmmakers having been directly influenced by him, adapting his works seeing films concerning Mishima's life. Additionally, he had the clout and funds to produce an independent film in the 1960s, no small feat given the nature of the studio system which we have touched on multiple times by now. Today, we'll be examining Mishima's life story, centering this explanation around his sole directorial effort, Patriotism. Through this film, we hope to examine and perhaps demystify one of Japan's best-known yet least understood public figures of the last hundred years. Yukio Mishima was born as Kimitake Hiraoka on January 14, 1925. From a young age, his grandmother Natsuko removed him from the care of his mother and father, Shizue and Azusa, and raised him on her own. This separated young Mishima from his siblings and allowed his grandmother to instill in him the aristocratic values she revered. Natsuko was the granddaughter of a daimyo, the provincial governor class present under the rule of the shogun during the Edo period. Ironically, despite upholding the nationalistic Japanese values that she saw in her aristocratic status, she married a bureaucrat who made his money off of western trade opportunities. This, as we will see later, could be seen as a precursor to Mishima's own adulthood ironic interest in Eastern and Western values. After a time living with Natsuko, she allowed Mishima to return to his parents, though she demanded a visitation at least once a week. Here, Mishima's mother recalled to John Nathan in his book Mishima, a biography, that young Mishima did his best to maintain the peace between these two domineering female figures. Shizue was at an inherent disadvantage, with her wants falling below both Natsuko's and her husband's, but Mishima took measures to not show distress at their conflicting views, and instead to try and appease the two women. His father was another story. From an early age, Mishima was told by Azusa that literature was feminine, and that writing did not adhere to good Japanese values. Mishima began writing in secret as a young teenager, often sharing his work with Shizue while his father was away. On more than one occasion, however, Azusa discovered Mishima's work and destroyed it, meaning that any number of stories he wrote early in life have been lost forever. At school, Mishima's teachers took note of his abilities, with one teacher promoting a short story of his to the point where it was published in a major literary magazine, Bunge Bunka. This wasn't a student literary magazine, mind you, but a professional periodical. In order to avoid the ire of his father and fellow students, Mishima took up the pseudonym Yukio Mishima, which he maintained until his death. At this point, World War II was well underway, with resources being diverted for military use en masse. In spite of paper shortages due to these demands, young Mishima's efforts in Bungay Bunka led to the story's publication as his first bound book, in a limited release of 4,000 copies in 1944. The same year, Mishima was drafted into the Imperial Army, but was misdiagnosed with tuberculosis due to his immense pallor, likely due to his grandmother's keeping him indoors for most of his youth, as well as his sickly physique. At the time, Mishima claims a certain amount of relief and excitement after being sent back to his home rather than to war, though writing in Sun and Steel, a book-length essay composed toward the end of his life, Mishima seems to have grown to regret this rejection later on. All throughout the war, Mishima wrote about the almost erotic nature of being constantly close to the specter of death. His family lived in Tokyo, where the American Air Force would frequently make bombing raids, meaning they were in potential danger throughout the war's length. However, when presented with the very real possibility of being sent to fight as a soldier in a war his nation was losing, Mishima was frightened. This almost fetishistic interest in the idea of death rather than the reality of it is something that emerged from a young age in Mishima, and which resurfaced time and again throughout his writings and actions as an adult. In spite of his early successes, Mishima wasn't paid much mind by the literary world following the close of the war. In 1946, Mishima had grown frustrated by his inability to gain a foothold as a major author, and with his father more or less having forced him into studying German law at the University of Tokyo. 
He sought out the help of Yasunari Kawabata, who you might remember was a member of the Shinkan Kakuha, or the New Impressionists, the group which composed the screenplay for A Page of Madness. Impressing Kawabata with two of his short stories, the elder author took Mishima under his wing, and helped to get multiple stories of Mishima's published in literary magazines throughout the latter half of the 1940s. It wasn't until the publication of his second full novel, Confessions of a Mask, however, that Mishima broke into the mainstream. Confessions of a Mask is seen in retrospect as both one of Mishima's best novels and a significant point in Japanese literary history. Being probably the closest thing to an autobiography that Mishima ever produced, it details the anxieties of being a well-to-do citizen of Tokyo during the war. Here, Mishima explores the major throughways that would come to define his body of work at large. His latent homosexuality, the questions of nationalism, the eroticism of beautiful death. In essence, while any number of biographies can describe Mishima's life in terms of events, Confessions of a Mask most succinctly explores his psychology. The novel was significant for Mishima as it cemented him as a major literary player both in Japan and abroad, which was perhaps more important for Japanese artistic relations following the war. Mishima gained such a huge amount of success, and his works were translated so readily during the early 50s that he was afforded a number of extravagancies of which most citizens wouldn't have even dreamed. Namely, he was able to leave the country. During the American occupation following World War II, only those Japanese citizens who absolutely needed to leave the country for governmental reasons were allowed to, with passports being issued by General MacArthur himself. Needless to say, this meant that your everyday Joe couldn't come and go as they pleased. In spite of this, Mishima was able to secure a passport and become amazingly well-traveled between Europe, Asia, and America both in this period and throughout the later 50s and 60s, once Japan became open again. What's more, Mishima's parents were interested in helping him settle down and get married. In 1958, he was married to Yoko Sugiyama, the daughter of a prominent painter. Rumor has it, prior to this, Mishima's parents at one point arranged a meeting between him and present empress Michiko for potential marriage prior to her marrying Emperor Akihito. Again, this is just a rumor, but it's a very believable one given Michiko's and Mishima's friendship, and given that it's indicative of the kind of high-class, aristocratic life he lived once he became established as a major art figure. The entire time that this whirlwind of a life was occurring, Mishima was writing. At the time of his death in 1970, he had published 34 novels, 50 plays, over 100 short stories, and dozens of essays. He went through multiple permutations in terms of subject and tone, retaining a flowery, elegant style throughout. And in 1959, a watershed moment occurred with the publication of Kyoko's House. Mishima spent several years working on Kyoko's House, a novel which he saw as his masterpiece at the time of publication. Weighing in at just around 1,000 pages, the novel has never been fully translated into English, though several English speakers have critiqued Kyoko's house and examined how its four main characters represent the different facets of Mishima in the later 50s. It was not atypical for Mishima to work sluggishly on some of his more major works, though you might be scratching your head and asking how he could be so prolific in such a brisk career if he took so long to produce a single work. The fact is that he would schedule out his times for work sometimes months in advance, marking down to the day the times on which he would sequester himself and compose entire stage plays. Due to the popularity of his name, he also had the advantage of being able to write for profit. So while Mishima would dash out novels for popular serialization which capitalized on this fame, he would slowly be working on what he might have considered his more serious works. The Sea of Fertility, the tetralogy of novels which he considered to be his magnum opus, surpassing even Kyoko's house, was composed in this way, being written over the better part of the 1960s, and being completed on the morning that Mishima died. All the while, he released novels one after the other. Getting back to the initial masterpiece, however, Kyoko's house was not well received by critics. It was considered boring and overly long, going on to become Mishima's longest single work. That is, if we don't count the entirety of the Sea of Fertility combined. What's more, critics were harsh on Mishima's thinly veiled self-insertion into the novel by means of the four protagonists. Later works would see his inclusion of personal traits within his characters, though these traits of his did not entirely define later characters. Rather, they were their own people who happened to share beliefs or experiences with Mishima, 
It's perhaps for these reasons, the lukewarm reception, the length, and being considered heavy-handed, that Kyoko's house remains untranslated. John Nathan claims in Mishima, a biography, that this cold shoulder from the world of literary criticism may be what pushed Mishima in the early 1960s into pursuing roles in film. His first role was in Afraid to Die, a Yakuza picture by Yasuzo Masumura, which saw Mishima in the starring role. By all accounts, Mishima was a nightmare to work with and a remarkably poor actor, but this role as a gangster allowed him to enact his fantasy as a violent rebel for the first time. Afraid to Die would not be Mishima's last excursion onto the big screen, and several years later, in secret, he began work on a new type of passion project. Now that we understand the pertinent portions of Mishima's life which led him to producing patriotism, we can explore several aspects of the work which will both help us understand Mishima and the film. Believe me, there is a lot more to cover with Mishima's life story, as love him or hate him, agree with his politics, or totally disagree, he was a very fascinating man who lived a bizarre life. Don't you worry, viewers, we'll get back into other aspects of his life someday. Given that this video will likely be as long as its subject already, however, it's likely best that we reserve the rest for other episodes. On that note, let's get into the nexus point on this entire video, Yukio Mishima's sole directorial effort, Patriotism. Patriotism is based on a short story of the same name penned by Mishima in 1960, six years prior to the release of the film. Supposedly, the story was a direct result of witnessing the Anpo protests in 1960, where university students and workers opposed the re-ratification of the Joint Security Treaty. They saw this treaty as a symbol of Japan acquiescing to America, and in this way Mishima may have been inspired in seeing Japanese citizens band together in a nationalistic manner. The story of both projects is nearly identical, featuring an imperial lieutenant named Takayama and his wife Reiko. Takayama arrives home late at night, having just learned that a number of his compatriots took part in a real-world event called the February 26th Incident, in which they attempted to restore absolute power to the Emperor of Japan. Due to their actions, his compatriots are doomed to failure, and probable death at this point, and have left Takayama in the dark, specifically so that he might be absolved of any guilt for the incident. However, his superiors have informed Takayama that he will take place in the counterinsurgent action the following morning. The action of the narrative then occurs when Takayama and Reiko resolve to kill themselves for the sake of maintaining their allegiance to the Emperor, as well as those that have already died. The whole process is ritualistic. If we're familiar with the story or the film, then we likely know how it's going to end, making the bulk of the narrative a practice in examining the minutia of the hours before they die. They bathe and beautify themselves, they drink sake, they make love one last time, and then in elongated, explicit detail, they commit ritual suicide. As for the contents of the film, that's really it. This is one of those rare situations where we feel the need to explain the whole plot, but also where much more can be gleaned from the context surrounding the film rather than its content. As we noted before, Mishima was an accomplished playwright as well as a novelist. He wrote in both the styles of kabuki and no, as well as other styles, and was noted for transposing kabuki tradition into a contemporary setting to critical acclaim time and again. Patriotism makes direct use of this background in the stage, as the set design directly mirrors that of a no stage. The extreme minimalism in props and set design is also an echo of the no tradition. The point here is the gravity of the action, not the beautiful nature of it. This, in turn, might explain the film being shot in black and white. Of course, this could also be due to the expensive nature of film equipment at this point in Japanese film history. That is to say, because monochrome film stock was simply cheaper than its color counterpart. Given that Mishima financed the project entirely out of pocket, this very well may be true, but like Yasuharu Hasebe utilizing monochrome in Massacre Gun to craft a noir story, Mishima here uses the potential restraint of black and white to increase the striking, stark nature of this filmed no-drama. Despite the intrinsically Japanese nature of this structure, Tony Raines claims in an essay on the film for Criterion that the film was intended for an international audience. He posits that the Japanese-ness itself would be a hot commodity abroad, and that Mishima's selection on the classical piece Tristan and Isolde may have been intended to help increase interest overseas. John Nathan confirms this in Mishima, a biography. Nathan knew Mishima personally in the early 60s when he translated The Sailor Who Fell From Grace with the Sea, 
Mishima composed the Japanese subtitles for the film and requested that Nathan himself translate them into English and use his connections to procure French and German translations as well. As a result, the film was exhibited heavily in Japan and abroad. We'll get more into the impact of the film in a bit though. For now, let's examine a few different points about patriotism that will help us understand it better and in turn inform us about Mishima's goals with the project. The historical and personal aspects that are important to understand in examining the contents and implications of patriotism are the historical setting of the film, what it tells us about Mishima's politics, and how it predicted later events in Mishima's life. The action of the short story in the film occurs on the outskirts of the February 26th incident, an attempted military coup d'etat which took place between February 26th and 29th, 1936. This infamous event has been the subject or setting for several other films, including Seijun Suzuki's Fighting Elegy, Yoshishige Yoshida's Coup d'etat, and Hideo Gosha's Four Days of Blood and Snow, as well as a play and another short story by Mishima himself. In Runaway Horses, the second part of his tetralogy, The Sea of Fertility, the planning stages of a remarkably similar event sparks the main conflict of the novel. So as you can hopefully see, this incident was a major point in pre-war Japanese history. The attempted coup was carried out by a faction of the Imperial Japanese Army. This group, known as the Gigun, or Righteous Army, were a subgroup of the Kodoha, or the Imperial Way. Both the Gigun and the Kodoha were composed mostly of officers who sought to kill their ideological rivals who they thought were poisoning the national spirit of the Japanese military. In the course of the incident, the Kodoha were successful in assassinating two former prime ministers, while failing to kill the contemporary prime minister. They also attacked the Asahi Shinbun's headquarters and took control of the Tokyo Metropolitan Police headquarters. Not because they fought the police, but because the police just kind of left, apparently. The rest of the military, naturally, fought back. In spite of the Gigun's personal appeal to Emperor Hirohito, the Emperor refused to give them any slack. He publicly paid lip service to their demands, while secretly permitting the rest of the military to use force in order to quell the insurrection. They had sought to perform what they called a Showa restoration, similar to the Meiji restoration of the 1860s, where power was wrested from the military government of the Shogun and returned to Emperor Meiji. Here, the Kodoha had the idea that a similar corruption was occurring, and that the most patriotic thing they could do was to seize power from those they saw as traitors to Japan and give said power back to Hirohito, or as he has been known since his death, Emperor Showa. In the end, the members of the Kodoha surrendered, hoping that their trials would become a sympathetic cause with the populace of Japan. There was a precedent for this with the May 15th incident, when in 1932 a group of naval officers assassinated Prime Minister Inukai Tsuyoshi for entering into the London Naval Treaty. This treaty limited the size of Japan's navy, which as you can probably guess incited a similar nationalistic fervor. The officers involved were caught, and all 11 were court-martialed. The trial, however, was public, and 350,000 signatures in blood arrived from sympathetic citizens asking for their release. Amazingly, because of this, the assassins were given lenient sentences, and none were put to death. Unfortunately for those responsible for the February 26th incident, the government had learned their lesson. While the majority of the 1,500 men that the original group of officers mustered were allowed to go during the course of the incident, the 25 who were directly responsible were court-martialed and private, away from the public eye. In the beliefs of the Kodoha and the Gigun, we can find a number of parallels with Mishima's own beliefs later in life. Firstly, we see the veneration of the Emperor and the interests in restoring his power. Dr. Ali Volkan Erdemir, in an essay on patriotism, argues that the narrative being set in the pre-war Showa period of 1936 could speak to Mishima examining the unrest of the 1960s through the lens of previous social upheaval. Mishima also seems interested in this narrative in examining the idea of sacrifice of oneself for the greater good of the collective. Lieutenant Takayama and his wife both feel that they need to kill themselves not just to avoid responsibility in the February 26th incident, but for the sake of the country. This sentiment extends even into the very name of the piece. The common word in Japanese for patriotism is aikokuhin, which is composed of the characters for love, country, and heart, 
However, this story and film are called Yukoku, Sorrow Country, which is more often translated as epidemic, and which means something like concern for the country. Not to mention that the lone scroll which adorns the wall in either version of the story bears the word for wholehearted sincerity. Mishima saw something virtuous in the efforts put forth by those attempting the coup d'etat, and saw a tragic hero in Lieutenant Takayama. He cast himself in the role in the film version, which speaks to a personal point that we'll get to later, but with respect to the present discussion, this tells us that Mishima deeply sympathized with the attempted Showa restoration, and perhaps that he wanted to bring about his own Showa restoration. In speaking candidly about the collection containing patriotism and the other two stories he composed about the incident, Mishima explained, quote, Surely some god died when the Nini Roku incident failed. I was only 11 at the time and felt little of it. But when the war ended, when I was 20, a most sensitive age, I felt something of the terrible cruelty of the death of that god. The positive picture was my boyhood impression of the heroism of the rebel officers. Their purity, bravery, youth, and death qualified them as mythical heroes, and their failures and deaths made them true heroes in this world." End quote. This leads us to Mishima's personal and political beliefs. As we discussed before, Mishima led a very rigid, structured life as far as his work was concerned. While one could argue about how serious he was concerning the beliefs he espoused, it would be difficult to argue that he wasn't serious about the practice of writing itself. We believe that this strict structure could even be called militaristic, an adjective that can be ascribed to most everything Mishima took seriously in life. Due to his sickly nature as a child, and due to his vanity, Mishima took up weightlifting and bodybuilding as an adult. Again, he kept a rigid schedule to this, never lapsing or taking time off from it. In this militaristic nature with which he took up these two activities in particular, writing and bodybuilding, we can see that Mishima was ripe for becoming a prominent activist and a fierce nationalist. As his life went on, Mishima became more right-leaning in terms of his politics. He believed wholeheartedly in the sovereignty and divinity of the emperor. In an essay entitled A Defense of Culture, he denounced Emperor Hirohito for publicly renouncing his godhood at the close of the war. He posited that Hirohito should have abdicated the throne and took the blame for the loss of life during World War II. In this way, we can't be sure if Mishima sought to bring power back to Hirohito or if he wanted to install the next successor. As Mishima further entrenched himself in these beliefs and infused his writings with them, he sought a further stage of militarizing his life, which leads us directly into the aftermath of patriotism's release, and how it predicted some later events in Mishima's life. In 1967, after the release of Patriotism, Mishima covertly joined the Ground Self-Defense Force, one branch of Japan's post-war military force. Using a public program in which the Self-Defense Force offered training for disaster scenarios to civilians, Mishima and a group of university students within his social circle trained with the military and on their own utilizing the military's resources. The latter of these scenarios was under the command of Mishima and was likely allowed due to his clout and popularity within the country. This group became known as the Tate no Kai, or Shield Society, whose purpose was to act as a shield to the throne of the Emperor. At the time, this group was seen as a vanity project of Mishima's and wasn't generally taken very seriously. It was only later that parallels were more publicly drawn between the Tate no Kai and the Gigun of the February 26th incident. The following year, Mishima pursued another vanity project with a series of photographs shot by Kishin Shinoyama. These photographs sought to portray Mishima as a masculine, somewhat homoerotic figure. One piece in particular was modeled after a painting of St. Sebastian's death, a painting whose discovery, according to Confessions of a Mask, coincided with Mishima's first orgasm. Again, this shows that all throughout Mishima's life, he was obsessed with the idea of beautiful death. It also serves as another example of Mishima committing in art a vision of his own death, something we also see in Patriotism, as well as several other films in which he appeared, and several books of his, including Runaway Horses. While working with the Take no Kai, a series of other events were occurring within Mishima's life. He got his hopes up several times at the chance of being the first Japanese citizen to be awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature. In 1968, however, his mentor, Yasunari Kawabata, was awarded the prize instead, and Mishima remained confident that another Japanese author would not win in the near future. In fact, he was right, with Kenzaburo Oe becoming only the second Japanese author to win the prize in 1994. In the following years, Mishima set about tying up all loose ends with friends and colleagues, without anyone realizing what he was doing. 
he wrote a will which split the rights to his works between his wife and his mother. Lastly, on November 25th, 1970, Mishima and a small constituent of Take no Kai members traveled to a local self-defense force base and overtook it, seeking to perform their own coup d'etat. Mishima and his compatriots barricaded themselves in the office of the base commander, taking him hostage. Mishima then went out onto the balcony and attempted to deliver a speech to the soldiers below. However, the whole time, police helicopters hovered overhead, and the soldiers heckled Mishima, both effectively drowning him out. Frustrated, Mishima shouted the traditional cry, Tenno Banzai, long live the emperor. He then stepped back inside and along with his second in command, committed seppuku, the traditional honorable method of suicide employed by samurai and the imperial military alike. Essentially, Mishima had used his clout with media figures, the military, and the Tate no Kai to orchestrate what he saw as a new February 26th incident, and to ensure that it would have maximum coverage. The fact that he modeled the whole event after the earlier incident makes one wonder if he ever intended for the coup d'etat to be successful in the first place, or if he was using it as an excuse to kill himself in a glorious manner. He had the photographs shot several years prior, meaning that the Mishima we remember is the Mishima he wanted to portray, a buff, sexualized, violent middle-aged man, rather than a withering old form. He wrote several death poems and a letter to his parents prior to the event, stating that he wished to, quote, die not as a literary man, but entirely as a military man, end quote. In Sun and Steel, as well as in interviews, he openly expressed his veneration of seppuku prior to his own death. For example, he was once quoted as saying, quote, Harakiri is a very positive, very proud way of death. I think it's very different from the Western concept of suicide. The Western concept of suicide is always defeat itself, mostly, but Harakiri sometimes makes you win. End quote. He also wrote in Patriotism a full decade before his death, quote, It would be difficult to imagine a more heroic sight than that of the lieutenant at this moment as he mustered his strength and flung back his head. All of these pieces of evidence would point to Mishima perhaps not being the most sincere in the beliefs that he espoused, but perhaps more so in the glory that they would allow him. While no one can speak for him personally, and while we'll perhaps never know what his true intentions or motivations were, these very counterintuitive aspects of his beliefs and actions speak to the depth and enigmatic nature of Mishima's character. Following the event, Mishima's now widow, Yoko, flew into a flurry, demanding that all prints of patriotism be burned. Unfortunately for her, enough copies had been circulated overseas that the film survives today. However, until her death in 1995, she sought doggedly to stop the film's distribution in Japan. Despite the film being the only high-grossing short film ever to be distributed in Japan, she appears to have been successful, with the film falling into obscurity until 2006. Reportedly, Yoko also saw to it that Paul Schrader's 1984 film Mishima, A Life in Four Chapters, a film which intimately explores Mishima's beliefs and dramatizes the events of November 25th, did not receive a proper release in Japan. Some have made the comparison of Yoko to a samurai wife, who maintains her husband's honor after his death. Yukio Mishima is one of the most profoundly confusing and cryptic figures in the modern literary landscape. There's a reason that he became as popular as he did in his lifetime, and that he remains as well known today as he is. As we said before, there's a wealth of other information we can explore with respect to his life, and with how his life relates to film. We could go on and on, but as we've hopefully explained here, patriotism provides a good jumping off point for learning about Mishima. It acts as a microcosm of his life and beliefs, and can help us to understand how he moved from being an aristocratic youth raised by a tyrannical grandmother, to being the first person to commit seppuku since the period just after the war. There are other aspects of his life that we'll get into, namely the question of his sexuality and how it interacted with his beliefs and his art. We'll be exploring this point in particular in our next episode. But for the time being, we hope that this can serve as a succinct overview of the character that was Yukio Mishima.